hello and welcome back to the Donahue Group. We're delighted you're joining us for another fun-filled, information-packed half hour of discussion. Uh, we're going to be talking about some local issues. Uh, and joining me, as always, the fearsome foursome, here we are, Cal Potter, former state senator, Tom Paneski, professor of mathematics at the University of Wisconsin, Sheboygan, Ken Risto, social studies guru, Maven, advisor to the superintendent, and my name is, <laughs> and my name is Mary Lynn Donahue. I'm the host and uh, delighted Joe to- out there somewhere just yeah. picking himself off a couch. <laughs> there we go. Uh, delighted to welcome you. Before we start, and before anyone says anything, my collar is supposed to be up. This is a fashion statement. Was it, is just it so that Johnny Cash? just so that everyone knows yeah, she and, went the movies and, and, and doesn't say gee it was a nice show too bad she could uh, not have put her collar down so rip, all right um, next show you can fold it down <laughs> there we go then movies. we'll know so um, you could call in and tell us how you feel about Maryland's collar yes and actually not so very good um, <laughs> we're all sitting here pretty <coughs> confident that the predictions that we made in our last show about uh, election results. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, basically rang true. I think we're, actually we're not a smart bunch at all. It was a pretty obvious kind of uh, prediction, but I think overall we did pretty well. I disagree vehemently. I thought it was, we had great nuance and insight into the predictions. Well, very good. Um, <laughs> no, we, we, any, we were right, right. I don't think we missed, we missed one. I think we had a couple that were really kind of close and then we... Well, um, one of the closer ones, uh, although the actual election turned out to be quite the opposite, was Bob Ryan versus Jack Westfall. Westfall, if you remember, won in the primary by just a few votes and got what my one of my partners would call a, something of a schwetzing in the uh, general election. I think he, I think it was a 60-40 split or about that. Um, and it was an interesting campaign. Um, Jack, you, you work with Jack and uh, Mr. Ryan is a, is a business leader and uh, um, so it's kind of an unknown quantity as to how all of that's going to work out. Dustin um, Haven and Silas Vanderweely, that was kind of a mm -hmm. yeah, one way or the other kind of election. And I, when I saw the votes at the end, you know, a, Dustin got 333 votes after all that campaigning and all the standing on the corner and the signs. Of course, uh, Vanderweely had done a lot of campaigning too, but it was a low turnout and just 333 votes. But that was, that was one we thought could go either way. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, I yeah. think we picked yeah we picked Silas, Silas. Yeah. we picked Silas but we thought we thought it'd be closer yeah, yeah. I don't know we're getting back to Jack and yeah I, I do work with him so I'm probably a little skewed here but I didn't see Jack in the general election campaign much I think we showed up for the forums but I didn't see a, a line a lawn sign um, I think the week before the I know the week before the election he was on vacation out of out of the country out of the out of town certainly so I'm not so sure. Um, you know, I think Jack was offering himself up as an as an alternative or a possibility, and I think once Ryan got in, there was Jack was content with winning or losing. Um, yeah, so. that could be. And Silas has now taken um, has won the the elections were at the last uh, city council meeting or second to last city council meeting. Silas is now chair of the committee of the whole, having won that election. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, obviously, he's come back to uh, to some sort of political life after losing in a primary. And it is hard to fight back after a primary loss. Even if it's close, you know, you feel a little, either you get really energized to work very hard or you... Um, or Wonder you, what's going on. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And uh, sometimes no matter how hard you campaign, um, it really doesn't make much of a difference. I remember talking to one of your opponents once who had run a very good campaign against you, had worked his lights out, Work very hard and still had the same percentage of loss as the guy who had run against you the time before and really Didn't hadn't campaigned at all, you know. So it, you never know how these things are going to turn out. And it was a low, it was really a, a low turnout. Um, Jean Clayunas says we expected uh, one handily. Um, Bonnie Serta won. I think there was probably not much, much mm -hmm. question there. Mark Hanna fought back a, a brilliant opponent and <laughs> clawed his way to victory. <laughs> and. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I think that uh, you know that was that was probably a pretty easy race uh, yeah. overall. You were and then say, Dan, you know, if Dan Berg didn't win. Boy, he did he not win. win. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, he only kept his county seat. He was running also for the county board of supervisors by ten votes. 
So um, if there had been just a little bit of a change there, Dan would have really had, I think, a, a really bad night as opposed to a pretty bad night. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then compounded a bad night by announcing immediately he was going to run against Graf. And at least in, and I'm in that district, uh, and I, oh, so I've talked to 20 right. or 30, 40 people in our district, and just the, if the quote is accurate in the press, that didn't sit well with at least the people that I spoke with, that there's a time where one should probably lay low for a little mm -hmm. while, and then perhaps if you want to challenge, you challenge, but the same night you announced that you're going to run against the other incumbent, that wasn't a good move. Yeah. No. Okay. That wasn't so. probably the most graceful New. Uh, defeat speech uh, in, uh, in the world's history, but uh, there you go. It's hard yeah. to lose. It really is. And uh, um, That's true. Some of us have been Although, there. Although, you know, on the positive side, yeah. I always admire people that run. Because exactly. Because if you exactly. haven't run, you don't know what it's like. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. And we've yeah. said it many times on this show that the whole process of voting and having contested elections is incredibly important. But when you're in that wonderful position of having an uncontested race, really life is good. It's a real relief. <laughs> it's, a real relief. <laughs> it's a huge relief. <laughs> Did you ever have an uncontested race, Cal? Yeah. Okay. Twice. Three times. Yeah. Twice in the Assembly and once in the Senate. Totally uncontested? Mm -hmm. Wow. See? Yeah. But maybe there were problems even way back that back then about well, it, it, or you were just it, so it came, formidable. In both cases it came after I had done very well in previous elections. And mm -hmm. so I think recruiting of a candidate against an incumbent who doesn't appear to be in political trouble is yeah. more difficult for the party that's trying to recruit that candidate. And I think eventually they look at other races and say, well, our time and energy and resources, when you've got an assembly of well, 99 people and the Senate of 33, half of which are up every two years, where are you going to put your time and energy? So they sort of move on, too. So sometimes by not having an opponent, it isn't always a reflection of the candidate, it's a reflection of somebody else outside the system saying, where are we going to spend our time and money? And it's not going to be in a district where we think we're going to lose badly. Well, it is a new day for the city council. That's fairly clear. Mm -hmm. And there's a fairly, fairly sweeping change in the last two years. Um, but um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Also very interesting to me that night, and I have to say, I was at the administration building from about 8.30 election night until 11 because I was um, tallying the votes for the League of Women Voters. And so I actually had a job, a clipboard, and I was an official person. And, uh, but I did, so I was there filling in all the sheets for these various little TV stations that, you know, we'd call in the, the vote totals to. And uh, so I saw, and with kind of astonishment as the referenda votes mm. kept coming in. And let's put it right up there, Sheboygan Falls Middle School referendum. Didn't do well. 87% to 13%, and presumably the school board election results mm. uh, clearly, I think, pretty clearly also influenced that as well. Um, not one single referendum won. Uh, none was even particularly close. I think the Random Lake at a 60-40 split was probably one of the closer ones. What Clear was message? The, what was the one for the uh, nursing homes or the, the, that was 56 to 44 or 54 to? You're right, that one was a little closer, but then just the, the next question on the referendum, uh, on the ballot about um, just exceeding spending limits. limits. It was another 80 20 kind of vote. Yeah. So, but you're right. Does anybody remember that, the nursing home percentage? I think it was about 56, 55. Yeah, Tom's, <clears throat> Tom's real close, if I recall, too. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that one was actually close, right. and of course, really reflects, I think, the not, not so much a divided community as we're divided in. I mean, I think everybody's conflicted about wanting to keep the nursing homes and, and, and yet mm -hmm. realizing that it's, it's a substantial drain on the taxpayer. Well, I think it also reflects the economic times. I mean, you've, it's got you've to. had a number of plant closings. You've, Tecumseh moving their, uh, many of the operations to Brazil. There are people today who are making much less than they did in the past. Gas may be $5 a gallon by summer, some people say. Um, food costs are going up. Everything's reflecting higher gas costs. Um, at some point, I think people are saying, I, my pocketbook and my credit card and my other debt is just can take so much and I don't need any more property taxes to pile on. And mm -hmm, I think there's mm -hmm. sort of a reaction here where people are expressing 
feeling and frustration over the cost of living and the debt that they're incurring, and this is the way they can. They can't vote on gas prices, they can't vote on food prices, but they can sure vote on their property tax, and I think government takes it uh, in, in the year every frequently. Uh -huh. we've, we've talked about the, that before, is that the real median income in this, in this county has not changed dramatically yeah. in 20 years. It's mm -hmm. barely, I mean, barely changed in 20 years. Yeah. So you, you're absolutely, I believe, I write Cal, I think that that's one of the things. I think the second thing is, is I still think there's a perception, and whether that's fueled by lots of talk radio or, 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 or maybe it is a reality, that I still think a lot of people still believe they can get their services and, and still say no to tax increases. That there's a kind of a, I should, kind of, there is a notion that there's just a lot of fat in government, and yes. if we put the, yes. their feet to the fire, we can keep, to, we can keep our services without having to you know, see tax increases. And you've you got that going on as well. And the third thing is I, I just think for a lot of families, what the definition of middle class is has changed, as we've talked about before yeah. too, is I see a lot of people going further and further into credit card debt trying to buy the things that they think a middle class family should have on top of stagnant income. And, right. and so there's just no mood to, to uh, to talk about you know raising right. spending caps, and that's why we're going to get into the state segment. We'll talk about you know some of the same kinds of things. It's very difficult. And, and you know, there, I've often talked about this before that uh, fifty percent of the people get divorced, so many of them have alimony payments and child support, and and then they also buy in the second marriage. They buy another home. They buy a boat. They buy an SUV. Pretty soon their debt is up to their eyeballs, and so they've created themselves a very unfortunate financial picture. Mm -hmm. And again, who becomes the scapegoat? It's the property tax bill that you get in December, which is the, the sort of the, the straw that breaks the camel's back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, those of us in, in, in the private sector who are always on the lookout for savings and, and um, where I mean, the money I bring in in my office, I bring in. You know, nobody gives that money to me. Uh, no third party gives that money to me. Well, you have to go out and earn it. Or you yeah. earn it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, making money the, the old fashioned way. way. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a commercial. Sorry, this is not a commercial. No, I know. Last, few, last few months, I feel like I've earned it. <laughs> yeah, no, no. And I'm, I'm just. But being, I know I understand. I, I'm That's just. Right. But in any event, I think there is that perception that. Um, and I'm not even going to say fat. I, it's just that there, when was the last time governments, you looked at how you do business? What was the last time you looked at your man management structure? When, when did you look at this? When did you look at that? And there is, because it's tax dollars, certainly the public sector moves more slowly. It must. It should. It, it needs to be accountable to the taxpayers. But I think good leaders these days are at least saying let's look at how we're delivering services and wouldn't it be nice if we could do a better job of delivering services at the same or maybe even less money i called the department of regulation and licensing yesterday um, and after about 87 different menu changes i just hung up because i was getting oh, yeah. discouraged uh, and then I have now, since then, sent an email on a fairly urgent issue, trying to check to see if this particular entity is, is, is a, a licensed provider and so forth. There's no answer. I called a local agency today trying to get some records for a client, and the voice message from the worker said, due to an unusually high volume of calls, I will try to return your call within the next 24 to 48 hours. And so in my little phone message, I said, please, <laughs> I need to hear from you before then. But we get back to Mayor Perez in his State of the City message said, I'm going to bring a budget before the city council that is, will have no, no increase in property taxes, no dollar increase, at least as I understood it. That's a big challenge. People have to look at different ways of doing business. The library is doing that. Is it going to happen in other places, I wonder? It's going to have it's to, come, yeah. and I think also what's going to have to also happen is is that people who are accustomed to certain government services aren't going to have them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that, that generally means the the poor um, and those who are struggling on the margins of society are going to be the ones that will see their services cut. They don't vote. There you go. They don't vote. They just don't, and so that's the way the political process will play out. Yeah. So I know Tom, you were. 
No, I didn't have any. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then that just brings me to just this little little bump on the uh, the local horizon, which is the charge for marching in the world's longest parade, parade. <laughs> on the Fourth of July. Um, we're filming on a day when the, the headlines tell us that the charge has now been reversed. The bump in the road is gone. <laughs> the bump in the road is gone. <laughs> well, it may actually be in the other direction. <laughs> I think a, a few wheels hit, hit, hit a hole in the road. But uh, it was, to me, it was an interesting way to... The 4th of July costs the city of Sheboygan a ton of dough. It just does. Uh, you know, besides the generosity of the Johnsonville folks for the fireworks and so forth. Yeah, and I love the 4th of July. And I even love that two and one half hour <laughs> interminably long parade. When I first saw it, I thought, oh, the parade will only be two hours <laughs> or maybe an hour and a half. But um, I, it seemed like sort of an entrepreneurial idea. You know, $10 for nonprofits, that's a pretty reasonable charge. 75 for businesses. This is a fairly cheap advertisement um, and boy it, it it just people aren't looking at new ways of doing things particularly so I uh, I don't know what do you think well I think government is looking desperately for ways of covering overtime for police mm -hmm. and public works and so on but uh, when you start uh, implementing things that people just don't normally want to pay for or think they ought to pay for they're going to tell you about it, and I think this is one example. Yeah. And I think the letters to the editor that came from veterans groups saying you're going to charge them what to barge in the parade. I, I mean, that was the that was a killer right there. You're not yeah. going to be able to yeah. implement something like that. I know it, it, it was interesting. There were no businesses who who made any complaints, mm -hmm. but uh, I uh, I don't know. It's uh, I'm getting fifty. What is it, uh, Johnsonville? contributes 50,000 or more Huge. towards uh, Huge. the fireworks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that should be highlighted as thank you. You know, you mm -hmm. know, we appreciate that. We bring a lot of people in, uh, enjoy the day, spend the money. Well, I figured, uh, it, I think the newspaper article today said that the city's about $7,000 short. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the parade is gonna cost, or the, the whole day, costs about $7,000 more than the income that's available. And I think that's what, you know, what the, what the mayor uh, was trying to do is just kind of close that gap up a little bit. But um, the better idea might have been just to pass the hat along the pay parade route. <laughs> well, let's see, there's 16 aldermen, and if they each contribute $100, and the mayor contributes $200, all right, you got $1,800. That helps. Well, and I guess I'll play the, mixing my metaphors, the Ebenezer Scrooge of, you know, the 4th of July. Is if the city can't afford to, to do the parade, you cancel the parade. And maybe that's what sort of experiences the community is going to have to have to understand that you have, you have to pay for things. There's no, yeah. you know, as an economist, there's no, you tell the kids all the time, there's no such thing as a free lunch. There's no free lunch. Now, I understand that, you know, people will, will say, you mean to tell me city government and that budget can't find $7,000 to run the parade? Sure they can, but you look at everything you want and we keep finding money. We, we, you school want, district well, does school this. district does this all the time. <laughs> I mean, you know, we have proposals to cancel certain programs, and then the parents do an uprising, and they show up at the board, and the board says, "Go find the money somewhere." And they ended up taking it, you know, twenty dollars out of uh, this budget, and eighty dollars out of this budget, and sixty dollars this budget, and you know, it works. It well, it works, <laughs> but then all of a sudden you're finding out, well, you know. There's other things you cannot do, but they don't have a constituency to go to the board and, and yell and holler. And after a while, there's an erosion of that. Now, is, so I think, you know, we almost, and no mayor is going to do this, of course, and so me talking smart on local television here can do it. Cancel the parade. You, know, you can have the fireworks yet. Johnsonville will do that. You have the cardboard regatta. Thank goodness that the Arts Center does that. Or you tell the local business property, because we're in the age of privatization anyway, if you want to parade business community or the JCs or the Chamber of Commerce, be our guest. You know, raise the funds and we'll and hire the police to do it. Yeah. Wow. City government will get out of the business Whoa. of parades. Uh, a little revolutionary talk here. It's the caffeine. <laughs> it's the caffeine. <laughs> Memorial Day. Forget about Memorial Day. Forget this about is the only chance I have yeah. for a political <laughs> career in this community. <laughs> Because no my chance. opponent's going to run these tapes <laughs> all day long. I hate to break it to you. You had no chance. So, you know, <laughs> That's okay. That, there we are. Well, and one of the ways the city <laughs> no, pays for all of this it. is the room yep. tax. And Susan Hundley um, 
had kind of a, um, uh, I had read Judge Langhoff's original decision, the lawsuit that was filed the, by the English manor, Susan Hunley, to saying that the city's use of the room tax dollars was uh, improper. Having drafted a room tax ordinance myself, I can tell you that the statute from which all of this comes is hardly a model of clarity and, and sensibility. But the Court of Appeals was pretty tough on her, or not on her, on her argument. Uh, I think patently ridiculous, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, was the, was the, yeah, yes. we typically, we, you know, you always hope that the Court of Appeals is not going to rule on your case with that kind of language. <laughs> but um, so, and, and there's no automatic appeal to the Supreme Court. So I think basically that's done. So the city does have some wide, wide uh, or leverage in terms of how it's going to use its room tax dollars and does use, as I understand, I think, as I understand, uses some of that money for, for the 4th of July. And, um, but uh, yeah, the city puts a lot of time and effort into making that parade go. So maybe it's something that the JCs or Rotary could take over and. <laughs> oh, I, I thought our time is somewhere. How, what do we think is going on on the, uh, the development on the, on the riverfront? Uh, we got this kind of changing subjects a little bit off the That's parade. That's quite all We right. got the, supposedly the boat, uh, the ferry that uh, little private industry is coming in is going to do the boat. And I think that sounds like it's exciting. And all that development that's going on down at there. Uh, I'm wishing everyone a success. That's putting a lot of money in there, but it's, uh, uh, well, it think seems to be there's a little germ of uh, uh, growing there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem is is that, I mean, do you just see that the the South Pier district being so crowded that I mean there there's been a lot of criticism of the um, the new three story building down on the peninsula that yeah. looks. At best, probably, Large. yeah, not, <laughs> not, not, not an exquisite architectural design, let's put it that way. Spaceport looks like it may just, in fact, may be go. a go. Yeah. Condos on that narrow little, little spit of land where the, the, the horrible green warehouses are now. Um, it's going to get kind of crowded. I mean, it, we're I all happy to see the development. Bright. The problem and, now is whether there's enough traffic for the, the water taxi and so on at this stage of the game. Yeah. You know, I think uh, Blue Harbor's future is a very bright one once you get more and more activity and, and more, more, more build there. buildings down yeah. there and businesses. But right now you're really kind of half built and that's always the problem. Who can survive and make enough money in this early stages to, to keep going? We yeah, wish it's them not going to well. be the Staten Island Ferry for a while. No, that's yeah. right. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, we had this little trolley car that used to oh, go from yeah. the waterfront yeah. area up downtown, and traffic was not very heavy there either. No. Someday, no. again, with the whole area developing, it probably will be. Mm -hmm. Well, as long as we're talking about innovation and things changing, just to switch gears a little bit, again, back to the school district, um, the... Uh, <laughs> And there are some changes uh, uh, out and about in an entrepreneurial spirit in the school district regarding charter schools. And um, along with voucher programs, which we do not have here in Sheboygan, only Milwaukee, but um, charter schools are making their way into the Sheboygan Area School District next year, both at, I think, the grade school and the high school level. Um, uh, there will be our, an, what's called an arts-infused charter school. I know my uh, junior in high school is looking at that for his senior year. And um, it sounds like interesting stuff. And what do you think? You're <laughs> at least until today, you had a job in the school district. The opinions expressed are my own <laughs> and only my own. <laughs> I'll start with that disclaimer. No, I, I think that, first of all, the, the, in candor, and again, this is just my opinion, if, yeah, well, there you go. Um, you there's there's state the money there. There's, there's, state, there's state money there. Yeah, the cut to the chase. There's state money there. You can get a, a, a reasonably decent pile of money um, if you can create charter schools. So there's a financial incentive for the district. The Although it's school short term. I mean, it's just Yeah, years. it's short term. It's over a couple of yeah. years. Yeah, it's over for a couple of years, and then you have to be able to fund it. And by that time, you hope it's... You hope that you're drawing enough students from outside your school district or bringing students who have left your school district because of school choice back into mm -hmm. the district that um, it actually ends up being a revenue enhancer for you uh, and at least revenue neutral. So you have that. Uh, secondly, I think there are uh, elements in the community that had, really don't believe that public schools can 
reform themselves, that they're big and they're bureaucratic, and there are hours in, in my life when I think the same thing. Um, and so reform, having charter schools will give people more choices within the context of public education. Um, the real question, and so, so that's really the motivation there, is to give people more choices. The, the district currently really does have a very uh, customer service mentality. I don't mean that negatively, it's just mm -hmm. what, do our, what do our parents want, what do our community members want, and we'll provide them with those kinds of forums. The, the, the multi-million dollar question for the state is, will these charter schools actually improve student achievement and serve those students well? And the record across the country so far is very spotty. Some charters have done very, very well and have increased student achievement and given kids who would normally have dropped out other alternatives. Others have failed abysmally. Uh, and so we'll have to see how it plays out in Sheboygan. Um, right now, they tend to be uh, sort of, I call them niche charter schools, mm -hmm. arts infused. Um, and that's, that's, that's not going to be a charter school next year. It's going to be a program, and then it's going to phase into a charter school. Um, and then there's some other proposals that may or may not be online. So um, there is kind of an entrepreneurial uh, bent to this right now. But the charter schools in, in, in Sheboygan, or anywhere in Wisconsin for that matter, that are, that are associated with a public entity uh, still have to take those fourth and eighth and tenth grade tests. And if they don't, they're actually, um, under the statute, under a lot more rigor, and they will be dissolved faster than a public school under the No Child Left Behind legislation. So that's... Which seems appropriate. I mean, yes. I, I well, and that was put in the statute to make sure that if you did have a fly-by-night operation or if you did have something uh, that um, wasn't working, that you could get rid of it pretty quickly. So it'll be interesting to see. And what's going to be interesting for the people of Sheboygan is those students are, in, in a sense, part of a a separate school. So people in Sheboygan don't know it. We have three high schools in Sheboygan now because the alternative school at Central on Virginia Avenue is now a third high school. So What's those, that yeah, those, that's a charter school now. Mm -hmm. It's not a program any longer. So they mm. won't be this year wearing a different color down at the bowl, but they will be next year. Mm -hmm. And they'll have a, a, a diploma signed by the Riverview yeah. principal, not North or South's principal. Yeah. And their state scores will be pulled out of North and South and be looked at separately and that'll be interesting to see how that plays out in those three high schools. The new information for me, yeah. The charter school movement <clears throat> is an interesting one because uh, it serves a number of masters. I, I, I've been watching it with a lot of interest. Uh, I voted for this in the legislature for the creation of charters and uh, with a lot of uh, reservation because in many cases it is really a specialty. And can you take the no child left behind comprehensiveness that you need to get out of these kids in tests and so on okay. out of a specialty school. We have to stop. We have to wrap it up in the entrepreneurial spirit. Thank you for joining us.